St. Thomas University Journalism, and the New Brunswick Beacon present The Basement Files. Hi, I'm Nicole Baer. I'm Robert Johnson, and welcome to this week's edition of The Basement Files. We have some great provincial stories for you this week. Our top stories are violence against women in Fredericton, PEI residents fear for employment insurance, and American students crossing the border for education. A Fredericton-based organization hosted an event for the public to come together and learn about family violence and violence against women. Shannon Mooney attended the event on International Women's Day and has more on the story. Is it hope that keeps you going? Is it Fredericktonians enjoyed local music, food, and presentations while celebrating International Women's Day. It was the first event put on by FEAST, or Female Empowerment and Access to Service Topics. It was held last week at the Charlotte Street Arts Centre. First of all, we have to say some thank yous. Well, we have to say Happy International Women's Day. Krista Steves was one of the event planners. I am the uh, lead co-chair for the Fredericton Regional Resource Network, and we are the lead organization for the creation of this event. Ten different organizations had representatives and information booths at Feast. The event revolved around presentations dedicated to raising awareness about women's services. One presentation focused on keeping seniors active. <laughs> Two volunteers from the Sexual Assault Crisis Centre attended the event. Sometimes students don't even realize that what they're doing is actually violence. So we go in and help that, and we go in and help prevent it. <laughs> One of the rooms was set up with tables of professional clothes, accessories, shoes, and more. It was all donated and there for women and girls to take. <coughs> the event was of no cost, but donations were accepted at the door. Proceeds will go towards a public service announcement. It will focus on programs and awareness of boys subject to family violence. I would like to see many more programs available for boys, especially who've grown up in, in violent homes, because they are our next perpetrators in training. This painting is the logo for the Fredericton Women in Transition House, where Diane Power has been the executive director for the last four years. It's not enough just to provide a roof over their head for 30 days and get them on in terms of support and into subsidized housing doesn't break the cycle. Nineteen women and children can be housed at once, but over the last 33 years, more than 7,000 women and children were helped. The house costs about $450,000 annually. Social service provides 70 percent of the cost, but the rest is fundraised or donated. Power says knowing people care and support the house makes her feel good. I am so impressed with the students, both of you and me and Stu, in terms of uh, helping us. I don't know if you're familiar with the Neville Jones bed push that happens every year, but it's a major source of funding for us. And the you and me women and Stu women, I think, they, they put on the vagina, vagina monologues just recently. It is an amazing feeling to go on stage and have that reception from the audience and feel like you're in doing something that's important. You're not only in theater, but you're making this movement. It's kind of beautiful. I mean, no, the students are awesome here in the community. They have been a big support to those. Um, I'm hoping they took it seriously. I heard different things from some of my friends. One guy said I did, we did very well and the message was portrayed and now he kind of understands what girls think of it all and I heard someone apparently was crying and I just hope that something was touched within some people. Back at the transition house, Power goes through the grocery list. She says her job is rewarding but hard because she feels like more could be done to stop the violence. Children suffer far more than people ever knew before. And I have up to three generations from the same family who've come through these doors. Power says 65% of the women they help experienced or witnessed domestic violence. She says that's a clear indication of a need to educate young students about violence and bullying. Well, you have to look at how bullies are created. And I bet you nine times out of ten they've come out of domestic violence in their own household. 
Like, so this isn't rocket science. Children do what they see. The Transition House for Women provides shelter, childcare, and food. And a staff member is always at the house to offer emotional support. The Fredericton Women in Transition House and other local organizations are dedicated to empowering, educating, and helping abused women. Some within those organizations say there aren't enough programs for boys and men. They believe that empowering women only targets half the problem, that until men receive the necessary help, the cycle will not be stopped. For Stu Journalism, I'm Shannon Mooney. The Maritimes are in danger of losing more residents due to the new unemployment plan brought in by the Harper government. Prince Edward Island residents are upset about the new employment insurance regulations. Many people feel the changes will have a disastrous effect on the province's rural areas. People from the small town of Surrey fear that the changes will impact their livelihood and worry that they may be forced to move west. Justin Cook has the inside story. The town of Surrey is typical of rural Prince Edward Island. Jobs can be hard to come by, especially permanent positions. Tourism, farming, and fishing are the island's three main industries. They're also all seasonal. One seasonal employer is the potato farm, Arthur Mooney and Sons. One of the owners, Andy Mooney, is a former MLA for the Surrey's area. Mooney said jobs in Surrey and other rural areas just aren't there. Right now the Surrey job market is quite tough. Um, the economy in the eastern and the western part of Pittsburgh Island has uh, suffered tremendously through the last few years. Um, the fishing industry is um, two of the major plants here have closed. One that was employing over 300 employees and the other one uh, 180 to 200. Um, so there's a, a real strong need for meaningful long-term employment here for sure. The Surrey plants closed two years ago leaving many unemployed. Islander Sandra Peters worked there for some time. She's also worked several other jobs to pay the bills. There are few businesses in place like Surrey, and most of them are only open for the summer months, such as Shirley's Takeout Restaurant. Peters has worked there off and on for nine years. She's had no choice but to rely on unemployment when she's been unable to find work during the winter months. The EI changes for us are going to be a lot of problems because we are seasonal workers. We depend on EI, or most of us do, um, because the jobs here are usually from April till September, October. Peters has lived in Surrey her whole life. Her two children and five grandchildren also live there. But now Peters is worried that her family will have no choice but to leave the province after the new EI qualifications. You have to leave your families behind and and go out there and see if you can make it. That's all That's all we can do. Current MLA for the Surrey riding, Colin Levy, feels others will be forced to migrate west to support themselves. It'll definitely affect PEI's economy because they'll go elsewhere for work and most of them are going west now for, for work, so we're definitely losing those people. The new regulations will make it tough on the labor force of a seasonal economy like PEI. The changes have created stricter guidelines for those on unemployment. Workers have been divided up into three categories, long-tenured workers, frequent claimants, and occasional claimants. Seasonal workers would be considered frequent claimants. They can still draw EI, but now it will only last a few weeks instead of a few months. After six weeks, they must accept any job available within an hour commute, even if it means a pay cut of up to 30%. The changes have been in effect for less than five weeks, so people like fisherman Terry Carter are still unsure what impact they'll have. It's a little too early. We have to get into another season because it just came this year. It, it may be a lot worse than what I'm hoping. I don't know for sure. Service Canada workers also now have a target of catching $40,000 in false EI claims each month. The government has been sending workers to make unannounced host calls to those receiving unemployment. Carter questions how useful this was. That is a lot of waste of money because they have to pay for mileage and meals and uh, 
looking after those people that they bring in from other places to do this. The changes will also affect business owners. Donnie Aiken is the co-owner of Surrey restaurant The Bluefin and Surrey's only year-round bar, The Black Rafter Lounge. Business isn't booming in the winter months, but additional employees are needed to keep up in the summer. The Bluefin only has 13 permanent employees, but during the summer months it provides 46 jobs. With these changes, employers are wondering how the work will I get done. I think it's going to affect a lot of businesses, especially rural areas, rural parts of Canada that have seasonal employment. It's the only way they can uh, actually survive. And how do you think this will affect your business? It'll be harder to get employees to come into work. The Mooney firm also relies on seasonal workers. It is one of several employers who need seasonal workers for their business to function. Like we're in the industry that we rely on uh, seasonal employees. Uh, we can't insure people to year-round work. And we have employees here that we can't run without. And uh, if they get pulled into other sectors, uh, the farming industry is going to suffer tremendously. But not everyone's against the changes. One PEI worker said people took advantage of the old EI rules. They said too many people would collect the minimum number of stamps and then just get unemployment. There are also those who continue collecting even when there are jobs available. These practices and the people who use them are known, but there's a code of silence. For example, this person wouldn't appear on camera because they thought the community would react harshly to this point of view. They said there are also others who feel this way and support the changes, but they won't express this publicly due to fear of retaliation. However, Mooney people said he uh, believes most people use and, the service uh, properly. Uh, they're shining the light on a, on a handful of individuals, I believe, but for the most part, people here are honest and hardworking, and if there's work to do, they're willing to work. Another change is that now people must prove they're actively seeking employment. This includes attending career fairs, registering for job banks, and skill evaluations. Those on EI will also receive daily emails regarding available jobs. For Stu Journalism, I'm Justin Cook. A local St. John restaurant has closed its doors and changed the locks after 40 years of business. The Aquarius Tavern will no longer be serving St. John and has left at least 10 employees looking for work. The shutdown came as a surprise to many people and the tavern was known as a landmark throughout the city. And even though the building was in need of repairs and updates, people say they will miss the Aquarius and it was one of the few restaurants left on the west side of the city. While Maritimers are having trouble finding work, American students are coming across the border for cheaper education. American students are coming to Canada for their undergraduate degree. A spike over the last decade has seen thousands of them to come to Canada for their education. But what's the sudden appeal to Canadian universities? Kaylee Moore traveled to the U.S. and found one small high school with the answer. Back in Canada. First year student Chris Brooks unpacks after his March break. I love going back home, you know, just, you know, see family, friends, see my dog, everything. But uh, it's always great coming back, you know, seeing my friends in res. Home, however, is in another country. The seven-hour drive to New Hampshire includes a border crossing, something Kelsey Trites is familiar with after her three years studying in Canada. Now that I've been in Canada for three years, I've really gotten used to the slight culture differences. Um, I use Fahrenheit and Celsius pretty regularly now. Uh, I've gotten used to the money and having loonies and toonies on me all the time. It's pretty funny. And more to the sayings. And I feel like I kind of stand out less as an American. I've kind of learned to blend into the crowd more. Trites adjusted easily, but says studying in Canada never crossed her mind until one day in guidance. I found out about studying in Canada through my guidance counselor. She knew a family from Maine whose daughter went to school at Stu, so she told me to go check it out, which I did, and I ended up loving it. Loving St. Thomas University so much that her guidance counselor encouraged more students to look north. Yeah, I went to like a really small high school, Kingswood, in um, Wolfboro, New Hampshire. And Brooks is one of seven Kingswood students really in three happy. years to head to Canada for school, five at St. Thomas. American students say the U.S. and Canada are very similar, but there is one main difference. It's just not home. Leaving home for the first time can be hard, and moving out of the country only intensifies this. 
So why are American students packing their bags to head north of the border? It could have something to do with these. The cost was the deciding factor. The biggest reason why I ended up going to study in Canada was really the, the price. I, I'm paying less to go to school in Canada than I would be to go to the University of New Hampshire, which is really impressive. Trites and Brooks would pay New Hampshire resident prices at UNH. In-state tuition is less expensive, but limits a student from leaving their home state. American students at St. Thomas say even with international tuition costs, Canada is more affordable. Trite's family welcomed the idea of fewer student loans. Definitely a benefit uh, financially. Um, she's in a much smaller school, um, in my opinion, getting a much better education and we're spending significantly less money. Kingswood guidance counselor Sheila Foley says studying in Canada is a wonderful opportunity. We always say to the kids now, let's look at Canada, which, which we just think has been a real blessing for us, especially in this economy, a huge blessing. It's opened up options for our kids that they never would have had before. American students need a passport and student visa to study in Canada. More than 10,000 U.S. students earn their degree in Canada each year, with rising numbers over the last decade. I will be very surprised, given the U.S. economy, if many of our kids not only go there but decide to stay there. Um, and uh, I know a couple who don't even want to come home now. Trites is one of those students, but says being away from Fluffy is the hardest part of studying far from home. I mean, who doesn't love a road trip, seriously? Like, road trips are just fun, always. Um, even if the road you're driving is really, really boring for hours, um, great conversation, with them. no matter who you're with, you're going to get to know them. And then you get to go home, or you get to come back here too, and that's, that's an exciting part of it. So, Brooks looks forward to the destination after his border crossing. But Trite says her first stop in the U.S. is Dunkin' Donuts. As for her future after St. Thomas University... To be honest, I'm not actually sure what my plans are after graduation. I think it's really just going to depend on where my life is taking me. Uh, my boyfriend's Canadian and I'm American, so that's kind of going to be something that's going to be a factor, and also mainly just where I can find a job. So I'm open to both countries. The Canadian government subsidizes post-secondary education far more than the U.S. These lower tuition rates benefit American students looking for an international experience without a trail of debt. High schools like Kingswood are catching on and encouraging students to look north. American students may have a long drive, have to get a passport, student visa, and convince their parents to let them study outside of the country. But they all say that the amount of money they'll save in student loans makes it all worth it. Not to mention the international experience. For Stu Journalism, I'm Kaylee Moore. The future of the provincial dairy industry is in question. Over the past 25 years, the number of dairy operations in the province has dropped by more than half. Farmers say it is a tough way to make a living, but the passion of farming outweighs the challenges. Anika Divenborden looks into that story. They are milk producers. They also require a lot of care and money. While dairy farming may have its benefits, it can also be a struggle for farmers. Farms operate 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Inside the operation, there's always something to do. Michael Buma owns Grants Brook Farms. The farm operates with two robotic milkers. The cows walk in on their own. A computer system does the milking. Yes, yes. Buma says now that they installed a robotic milker, he has more time for family. Because I have more free time available uh, as far as scheduling, I can do things with the family. Uh, if it's a soccer game or if it's uh, you know, a dance rehearsal or whatever, I'm not on a schedule where I have to be in the barn at said time. I can say, yes, I'll be there. For Derek Guitar of Shoreview Holsteins, it's a different story. Milking starts at 6.30 in the morning. His day only ends in the evening. I'm usually finished for the day between 8, 8.30. So all in all, Furman takes up most of my day, six days a week. Here, they have automatic takeoff milkers. Someone has to assist the whole milking process, putting the milkers on the cows and letting them out once they're done. Milking is less of a chore for Buma, but there's other work to be done. I take care of all the baby calves, and that usually takes me a good hour or, or more. Um, cleaning, scraping, uh, bedding down calves. 
Calves make sure to let the farmers know when it's feeding time. Now she's a happy girl. The number of dairy operations in the province has dropped considerably over the last few decades. 25 years ago, there were about 500 farms. Today, there are just over 200 left. The hard work that goes into farming is not the only factor that plays a role here. Owning a dairy operation is expensive, and farmers sometimes find themselves struggling financially. The price of milk is low. Farmers are usually paid between 75 to 80 cents per liter. The milk truck arrives every second day to pick up the milk. It leaves with a full tank, but farmers are still left with challenging profit margins. Live off the margin between what our costs and between what we get for our milk, that's our biggest challenge. Etienne Jean has been a milk truck driver for almost 40 years. His route changed considerably since he first started. That's because so many dairy operations have gone out of business. We had 28 perm there when I started. Uh, we have four left and three talking to quit. So it's, it's, quite, a, it's quite a change really. Uh, the people don't seem to be able to make it anymore. They, they change four quarter for a dollar. That's, that's the reason. If there was money in it, the young people would stay, but it, there's no money in it. As simple as that. Is there a future for the dairy industry in New Brunswick? What will it take to attract more young farmers? Reg Perry is the chairman of Dairy Farmers of New Brunswick. He believes the future is in fact healthy. There has been a number of ongoing operations bought in the past year and I think there's going to be more bought in the future. Um, so I think it's a good time for dairy industry. There seems to be more people getting in now than there had been in the past. Scott Gauntz is one of the youngest dairy farmers in the province. He followed his dreams last year and bought his own operation at the age of 24. Here I was a beef farmer that always wanted to be a dairy farmer and be able to farm my entire life. And I like to say that some people are foolish for not wanting a life of farming. I couldn't imagine my life without it. To follow his dreams, Gauntz had to make sacrifices. We don't have holidays on the farm. The cows need milk no matter what. And I guess <clears throat> a lot of people don't understand that. They get to sleep in every day and we get up at five every day. I can't even sleep in on weekends anymore. <laughs> Perry says they have a program in place to attract new farmers like Gons. So far it's been a success. If a new producer qualifies, we give him 12 kgs uh, for a period of time to use. He has to pay it back after that period of time. But that's a helping hand to get them started. And I say there's I think seven that have started up under this program. Gaunt still worries about the future of the industry. We worry that there, there will be only 20 farms left in the province where they all milk 800 cows and that's, that's too much of a factory farm and I hope that it doesn't come to that. Perry says a big issue today is succession. Who will take after the farm when the farmer retires? I think the majority of it is that Farmers don't have family members that are wanting to take over the farm and whatnot. Because certainly if there's family that, that want to take over farms, most times the transition takes place and it keeps going. Buma says young people today are more tempted to go for the higher paying jobs. It's a tough way to make a living. It's, it's, not, uh, it's not like other jobs where you work from 9 to 5 or your 40 hour week. It's a 60, 70, 80 hour week. And in this new age, people see uh, guys making $20, $30 an hour or working 40 hours. It's really hard to stay on a farm. Farming may be a tough way to make a living, but Gon says it's not always about the money. I was an electrician and my brother, who's my business partner, he was an industrial mechanic. So we come from well-paying jobs to become dairy farmers and our salaries aren't quite what they were. but. It's not always about money, it's doing what you love. The industry has its challenges, but farmers still say it's a rewarding lifestyle. Personally, I, I just love working the ground. Uh, nothing like the fresh soil, the smell of the fresh soil planted in the spring, working with animals. Uh, if you want to get a picture of the newborn calf in a moment over there, uh, you know, seeing life come uh, forth. It's just rewarding that way. 
Although the challenges of dairy farming in the province have put some out of business, it hasn't stopped others from starting up. The future remains hopeful for the dairy industry. It's safe to say that farming is a vocation much more than it is an occupation. For Stu Journalism, I'm Anika Davenborden. Cheerleading is growing in New Brunswick and all across Canada. It was once viewed as girls in skirts jumping around at sports games, but Caitlin Doiron shows there's much more to the sport. Cheerleading. A sport, an activity, a hobby. No matter what you call it, one thing remains. Canadian cheerleading is becoming more popular than ever. New Brunswick has 12 cheerleading clubs, half of which have been formed in the last five years. Fredericton has 11 teams alone. The University of New Brunswick has two cheerleading teams, each a different level. The team level indicates the difficulty of the stunts. Katie Davey has been cheerleading for nine years. She's in her second year of university. She coaches and performs on the level six team and also coaches for Infinity Cheer in Fredericton. So I think in Fredericton um, it was taking a while to kind of get roots but now that it's gotten the roots, there's been leaps and bounds in how much the cheerleaders are improving, how the programs are growing, and just how they're doing in competitions. Um, so it's obviously a really great step. Both the UNB teams compete at the same competitions, but are in different divisions. In cheerleading, teams practice and perform routines of 2 minutes and 30 seconds. Jumps. dance, tumbling, and stunts. The higher the division, the tougher the routine. This is a Swedish fall pyramid. Only level 6 teams are allowed to perform it. Cheerleading routines are judged and scored on the execution of different categories in their routine. Nicole McDormand has been involved in cheerleading for 20 years. She coaches three teams for Cheer Extreme All-Stars and says there are more cheerleaders now and they're judged a lot differently. Um, the skill levels increased quite a bit and what's expected of the athletes has increased as well. So there's a lot more tumbling involved, um, a lot more intricate transitions and stunt mounts and dismounts. Five teams competed at a competition in St. John earlier this month. They hoped for an invitation to attend the World Championships in Florida this April. Teams from Halifax and Quebec got the invitation, along with the PCT Cobras from Toronto. That's Scott Marasio's team. He came to St. John specifically for the bid. He's been cheering for nine years and says he's glad to see the shift in cheerleading, especially towards men. I never really got like a lot of like bad feedback. Um, even still, when someone asks me like what I do and I tell them I'm a cheerleader, I wait for their response. But nowadays, it's a little bit more accepting. Tiffany Henderson is on Terra Nova Elite Rock Electric, a team from Newfoundland. She finds a big difference in cheerleading since she started when she was 12. When I first started cheerleading, we didn't have nearly the same kind of rules that we have now. There, it wasn't as regulated. It wasn't as big. It was a very small thing. Only some schools had it. So it was... It was more cheering at games and less of the athleticism that it has now, so it's completely evolved since when I started to now. Completely different sport altogether. Henderson also agrees there's a misconception when it comes to cheerleading. I just think of it more as ignorance. People just kind of think of cheerleading as a stereotypical cheering at games and they don't realize how it's evolved really and, and how much of a sport it's really come. Like most cheerleading teams, Terra Nova practices two to three times a week for several hours. Their season runs from May to April. And athletes are not the only ones who've seen the difference in cheerleading over the years. There you go. Thank, Thank you. you. Allison Fitzpatrick owns All That Jazz. She used to sell mostly dance clothes, but in the last few years has more customers looking for cheer gear. An average week I might have had before one or two cheerleaders coming in looking for those sorts of things. And over the last, probably, like I said, two years, I would probably get, you know, five or ten cheerleaders in a day. To meet the demand, Fitzpatrick sets up booths at cheerleading competitions. Two years ago, she only had booked two competitions, 
but this year she has 20. And just like any sport, you can't forget about the parents. Michelle Langell's two daughters are cheerleaders. She says she's come a long way since they started. Just like her daughters, Langell is dedicated. She's only missed one competition in the last eight years. It's just a matter of where you put your focus. And for me, it's just always been I made a decision that I would be there with them. Cheerleading takes a lot of determination, skill, and commitment. And as with any sport, something just keeps bringing the athletes back year after year. I think it's the feeling that you get. You work so hard on something and you can't even describe it until you get out on the floor and it's, it's like just putting all these pieces together for this final performance, you know, and, and you get this adrenaline rush and the crowd is cheering and I, I really, I can't even put it into words. Cheerleading has come a long way from what it used to be. In the last decade, it's evolved into something entirely new. Now cheerleaders aren't just cheering on the sidelines for someone else, they're a team of their own. For Stu Journalism, I'm Caitlin Duero. In other sports news, Ashley Jordan not only finds time for school, she's a star volleyball player, holds a part-time job, and most importantly, is a mother. Robert Johnson explores the life of the 24-year-old. That's Ashley Jordan, number 15 for the St. Thomas Tommies. This week, she was named a CCAA All-Canadian, which means she is ranked one of the top 10 volleyball players in the country. She is Stu's team captain and led her squad to an 11-game winning streak and made her a first-team All-Star and Player of the Year. But volleyball isn't the only activity keeping her busy. She is also a mother of a two-year-old boy. Ashley Jordan is in her final months of university, but she didn't take the normal route to get here. She graduated from Minto High School in 2007, then started at St. Thomas. She became pregnant during her second year, and with that, she had to put her education on hold to become a mother. After my second year, I decided to take some time off to kind of figure out what I wanted to do, where I wanted to be. Um, and I was planning on coming back, but then I got pregnant, so I had to take another year off. She had Noah in November of 2010, and since then, her life has not been what she expected. After she gave birth to Noah, she wanted to get back to school and finish her degree so she could support him. If Ashley was going to go back to school, the one thing she was going to find time to do was play volleyball. Katie Cornelius plays volleyball with Ashley. Describe Ashley as a girl who definitely has a love for the sport of volleyball, but has a love for her family too. So she like, knows how to perfectly balance that. So I just describe her as like a basically well-rounded girl who's somehow able to balance the crazy life that she has. For Ashley, it wasn't going to be easy coming back to school after she gave birth, and it definitely wasn't going to make it easier to play a varsity sport. But this was a challenge she was up for. Pregnancy rates play a key role in the significant disparity in high school university graduation rates. Pregnancy is the number one reason girls drop out of school. Approximately 70% of girls who give birth leave school, more than any other group of high school and university dropouts. Women who leave due to pregnancy report they would have stayed in school if they had received greater support from the adults at school. Out of 70% of girls who drop out of school, only 20% come back and graduate. But graduating was something Ashley was determined to do. After Noah was born, she had to find time to manage everything. School, volleyball, the gym, and work. For anyone else, one of those things would be hard. Each one separately takes so much of your time and you have to put like everything 100% into it. And obviously I'm not going to be able to put 100% into everything, but I definitely try the best that I can. So it's, it's kind of difficult because Noah comes first and then it's school and then volleyball. So it's definitely hard to try and get it all done. <laughs> volleyball instantly became her favorite sport in middle school. She always excelled at it, and when it came time to go to university, she wanted to try out for the team. Head coach Ed Welch knew there was something special about Ashley Jordan from the moment she tried out, and he was right. After she dropped out to have Noah, 
she came back to the team in 2011 and continued right where she left off. She was an all-star, and the, this past season she won MVP of the league. Although they ended up losing in the finals, it was still an amazing year for her. Teammate Ksenia Sehek could not be more proud of how Ashley handled everything. I've always been taught, you know, life comes first and then you're a student athlete. So she's a mother first, then she's a student, she's an athlete. So to be able to, to do all that together is, is amazing. And um, she takes pride in being a mother first and then a student and then an athlete. And she does everything exceptionally. When she returned to the court, she had one more fan by her side, her son Noah. He loves nothing more than to watch mom play volleyball. He wakes up every day and asks her if she's playing. He is at every home game, and when Ashley's on the road, she calls Noah to tell her all about the game. He makes me put it like to bring up pictures on the computer so that he can watch mom play volleyball. So he definitely <laughs> likes like when we drive by the school. He's always like, "Are we going to watch volleyball?" And I'll have to be like, "No, not today." And he gets very upset. So. In her last game of the year, she was honored with the highest level of acceptance by St. Thomas Athletics as she was given her jersey for her four years as a Tommy. Now this, her final month at St. Thomas, she has been thinking a lot about her future. Currently, she is majoring in English and Criminology and hopes to be accepted into the education program and become a teacher. This year has been an up and down year for Ashley. Noah has been sick a lot, which has put a huge strain on her studies, but in the end, she wouldn't have changed a thing about the last six years of her life. For Stu Journalism, I'm Robert Johnson. That's all for this edition of The Basement Files. You can find us online at the mvbeacon.ca. Thanks for watching.